actually included that very interesting discussion of Michigan food. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Daniel D'Amico, and now here you are, and we're discussing many things. We were just now discussing the sheer brutalism of the dietary uh, choices of Michigan, uh, <laughs> which is where I am. And um, uh, yeah, so last night I ate out of, uh, I, I spoke at a, a hunting lodge on Bitcoin, actually. And uh, the walls were adorned with insa insane things. I mean, like pigs with huge horns and uh, uh, gigantic bears twice my size, you know. Uh, pigs with horns? Pigs with horns, yeah. I mean, pigs with horns. Um, and then there's this other deer-like moose elk thing that has a horn that grows out of its head, but then it grows forward and like it lands between yeah. its eyes and creates like this plate with spindly things on the end. And, cool. and and apparently in Michigan people like to kill them and put their heads on the wall. When in Rome. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, Daniel, when uh, you reread my article, now you read it. Uh, my, this is my article on brutalism and humanitarianism, and libertarianism. You read it before it went to print, and I thought you made some really good uh, emendations or, or even correctives to it that I didn't quite include in the article, but I kind of wanted to cover that in this hangout with you. You say you reread it this morning? I did, and first I want to just say that I, I really like and enjoy the, the architectural metaphor. Um, I took a, a, a course in architecture in college, and I had thought that we were going to, like, study flying buttresses and look at pictures of, like, the Leaning Tower of Pisa and stuff like that. But it ended up being a class about urban planning and the failures of centralization, a lot more so. And I think that that history behind brutalist architecture is something really interesting that you're... you're your article brings to to the surface of libertarian discussions. First and foremost, I think it's interesting to note that brutalism was founded on humanitarian principles. It, it was a progressive project of promoting class equality and 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 material condition living equality across classes. I mean, modernist architecture across the board was sort of promoted in that in that mode of public housing that would that would put people of low and high incomes relatively in close proximity to one another. It was sort of a, a designed attempt to, to promote community. Ironically enough, the failures of brutalism were that it ended up being far more useful for totalitarian purposes of crowd <laughs> control and riot suppression on things like college campuses uh, than it was for actually like living in or, or, uh, or, or building genuine civic communities. Wow, uh, that's very interesting. Because I did look through a number of, because I, I actually never studied architecture, and for me, to discover brutalism as a theory was a little bit of a revelation. And it took it took me a long time to kind of wrap my brain around it. I read some of the original brutalist writings, and uh, the severity uh, that and their their kind of fundamentalism uh, was a little alarming. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the idea that anything anything uh, like a, a, a fancy or, or, or appealing or any... Function any, over form. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's not just that it favors function, it's that it rejects everything but that. You know, I mean, well, it's, it's like and again, I mean, the sort of... approach. The bigger intention behind that was socialist. It, it, the idea that, that uh, form and flair were were bourgeois, were, uh, were, were signs of aristocracy, that there was a, a, a greater pressing need for function of like the lower classes and the, and the, working, uh, the working poor. Um, so, so it seemed sort of frivolous and luxurious to have facades or... I mean, there, it, reading your article, the first thing that came to mind was sort of Fountainhead and 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 Rand's discussions in uh, in in her uh, appreciation for architecture. Um, but again, I think I think there's a, a really I mean architecture just in general and urban planning 
have tremendous sort of uh, unintended consequences stories uh, that libertarians can certainly learn a lot from. Now, uh, can I stop you on that point about Rand? Because, um, of course, as I was going through this, I kept my mind kept going back to Rand, right? Mm -hmm. That's inevitable. Uh, you're talking about architecture and liberty. Um, but now, Rand's, as I understand uh, Rand's um, architectural ideals, they were always aspirational. There's a kind of a vertical dimension to them. Uh, they embraced modernism in a way that, as far as I understand, brutalism actually rejects it. Um, uh, so, so Rand uh, wanted to elevate form as a way of kind of highlighting the achievements of the human mind. So, I mean... I, I think similarly about Rand. Okay. What, I, I think the architectural metaphor parallels her ethics. In other words, she wants to see what Smith calls approbation or like moral approval um, to be in line with objective productivity. So if you're the type of person that can build a railroad, then you deserve respect and appreciation. In architecture, it's not to say that form has no value. Right. It's that when we have a form or an aesthetic appreciation of form that ignores function, then right. that's problematic. So she wants to bring those things like in line. She yep. wants people to think brutalism's beautiful in, in, in some sense. Um, and I do think that there's there's a movement of, of people that, that recognize that. I think, uh, and I wrote about a, a blog post for, for Liberty Fund Facebook group a really long while when the first Atlas Shrug movie came out, um, that most people confuse this about Rand. They, right. they think that she's either describing the world as she sees it or describing her utopia. And I don't think she's doing either one. I think she's describing what she thinks is a mechanism to bring the world from what we have to where she thinks it needs to be. Right. And, and she was not reactionary. I mean, she was really progressive and pro-human being. I mean, I don't get that sense from the brutalists uh, at all. The, I think you add actually a very excellent point that there's a kind of a collectivism in, in brutalism, that they wanted to strip out all indications of taste and style and class and complexity of you know, the social order and just, just kind of create blocky, gigantic structures that unify us all in a single mm -hmm. uh, kind of hom homogeneous existence. That was a rant. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah. I guess what I think is... Um, my, my, my sort of devil's advocate defense of, of brutalism isn't the caricature that, that you describe, but what I would think of as maybe nuanced brutalism or um, uh, pedagogical uh, brutalism, which is in the liberal tradition, there's a lot of people who teach and communicate their theory by comparing institutions by 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 sh shocking uh, context <laughs> and in historical application that's what happens with brutalism right we design this thing with these grandiose uh, aspirations of human equality and all of this other stuff and then plop it in somewhere that is not ready for those types of, of rigid uh, protocols um, so yeah. for example like Brasilia you, you like you take super modernist brutalist architecture and put it in the middle of the capital city of Brazil with all of these like more diverse and culturally infused yeah. populations and they're they're yeah. totally not not comfortable with it right but to some extent a lot of what liberalism uh, scholars and researchers and, and theorists in the liberal tradition did was just that yeah. Bernard Mandeville for example uh, fable of the bees it reads kind of like blocks defending the undefendable in so far as he's just saying, like, hey, you know, we live in a world where we have certain ethics and certain um, moral ethics, but some of them are really screwed up, and here's this completely counter perspective that's going to force you to sort of step outside your comfort zone and, and compare and contrast those ideas with one another. And I do think that there's, there's like a really strong pedagogical function to that. Yep. Yeah, and and that's that's the thing, and I, you know it's, uh, the article's only been out like four or five hours now, and everybody wants to know 
well, who are the brutalists and who are the humanitarians? <laughs> but I don't think that that's a very productive exercise because these are kind of ideal types in a way. And I think you're right that we need that kind of brutalism. The problem is, as I understand brutalistic ideology, it's an argument that it should always be limited to that. Like it should never grow beyond that. That our arguments are compromised insofar as they're more expansionary and um, evolved. I think, I, I, I don't know what to what extent that particular um, thread is, is inherent. I definitely come across that sentiment in libertarian circles, and I agree with you that it's like just as problematic. Um, in particular, when you read Rothbard's material on strategy, um, right, and it's not necessarily core to the ideas or the science. It's explicitly a strategic uh, aim at how to promote social change or grow the libertarian movement, and. I, I mean, he takes this from, again, totalitarian uh, strategists, like Marxists, in a sense. He, he, he's recommending a sort of core cadre of hardcore advocates with uncompromising uh, uh, principles. And, and there's, some, uh, there's some network theory to support uh, that sort of view, that if you look at a population um, where, like, 60% believe something with lukewarm uh, sincerity. It won't necessarily spread to the entire population or become a standard view. But if you take 10% of the population and they believe something with like full sincerity and enthusiasm, that potential to grow and spread throughout the majority of the population is a lot higher. Um, but that's something very different from this uncompromising, unwavering, sort of uh, unwillingness to, to grow and adapt issue. Right, top, top down. Uh, this, you know, Murray, Murray's views on strategy are very interesting. I mean, the one thing is that there, he had a meta, meta theory of strategy, which is that uh, the main goal of strategy is that there are two things. One, it be moral, and the second mm -hmm. thing, that it work. And whatever achieves that, he was all in favor of. Murray was great because he just began the discussion of strategy, not because he had the answers, <laughs> you know. And he was always open to considering other points of view. And in fact, I think he's changed his strategic outlook throughout his throughout his his, his life in some way. But I would agree with you that that sort of Leninist top-down cadre style approach, you know, would tend toward brutalism, you know. Uh, so yeah, thought doesn't matter, expansion, elaboration, new ideas, none of that matters. What matters is, is sticking to uh, known truths and, and shoving yeah. them you know, as far as you can. I mentioned, I mentioned to this to you when I first read your piece, and I, I imagine you're getting a lot of similar feedback, is that people think it's a false dichotomy or that they don't particularly fit sure. in either of the two categories. Um, but I do think that you're you're pointing out a very meaningful distinction because those like reading it on um, uh, brutalists in the natural rights tradition seem an obvious parallel. There's some threads with objectivism that seem an obvious parallel. The humanitarian aspect is undeniable with with modern movements like the bleeding heart crowd, the libertarian feminists, etc. When I read similar um, opinion editorials or discussions about the factions in, in libertarianism, I consistently feel like neither of them Apart. describe me, whether it's brutalism versus humanitarianism right. or any of the other dichotomies that go around. And I do think that there's well, a mis... That's why we love you, David. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, I mean, this isn't... Uh, I'm not trying to say, like, I'm so individualist, per se, but I do think that there's a, a grouping of the, the more academic-oriented libertarians right now who are sort of stepping back from this libertarian strategy uh, debate um, insofar as what I think um, is missing here is the relationship between the science of liberty and the libertarian movement. Um, and I, for me, I mean, if you ask me, like, why I self-identify as libertarian, it's not really on normative grounds at all. It's not because I care about the world, and it's not because um, uh, 
I, I, I'm like uncompromising or, or want to insulate my own prejudices per se. I, I, I guess I'm just a libertarian because I think that human liberty and freedom is the most explanatory variable in social change and social history. Mm, that's a um, good statement. Yeah. And, and when I read Mises and even Hayek and Smith, that's what I think that they're saying is that liberty is a conclusion, not a principle. Not, it, it's not a foundation to start a strategy per se. It's an inferred strategy given uh, a, a body of science. Um, and, and I think that that gets downplayed or, or overlooked in a lot of these strategic discussions that, that what I think is far more important isn't how many libertarians there are. Right. It's how accurate the body of understanding surrounding the role of human freedom is in our society, if that makes sense. You know, um, I think it. I think it does. Um, you know, I, I'm finding myself more and more interested in just describing myself as an anarchist, actually, yeah. in the libertarian, because I think it's a, a better description of what I actually believe, which is that I have no sort of um, goal for the social order itself, um, but. Uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm really dedicated, and I would say sort of dogmatically so, to the idea of anarchism is because the state is inherently brutalistic. I mean, like, you can't ever be anything other than that. It has to draw certain conclusions. It has to presume certain ways that the world works. It has to um, treat people as, as if they're motivated by one thing and not another thing. And there's no experimentation with the state. You know, everything is a given. I mean, it has so many features of, of brutalism to it, whereas everything outside of the state, you know, there can be features of brutalism to it, but mostly there's ongoing experimentation and evolution and change and, and surprise and trial and error, you know. I mean, that's, to me, that's a fundamental reason to be an anarchist, is, is just because we don't know, you know, how wonderful the world can be. And we have to kind of let it run itself in order to discover that. I, I think you're absolutely right on that. There's a, a great line from James Buchanan that uh, order is defined in the process of its emergence, uh, which is complicated to understand, but it's basically the notion that a market system has no purpose, no, no, no overarching intention. Um, it's only the the interaction of the purposes of the people in it that contribute to some distinctive purpose. Like that's the essence of what spontaneous order is really all about. Right. So, so I think that there's often um, a tendency for, for, for false humanism or, or false humanitarianism in, in the liberal project that, I, I mean, to some extent, the beauty of liberty is that no one, it didn't, it didn't require people to stand up and say, I love humanity, in order for human civilization to progress. Um, that progress was in large part an interactive process of a bunch of brutalists. <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's sort of like if you, if you, if you, uh, it, Pete Leeson's work is fascinating on this margin, right? You take a bunch of pirate brutes. Right. And they develop remarkable rules and constitutions to mitigate conflict and and uh, coordination amongst them. Um, the higher the stakes, the sort of more jerks that you have to cope with, the right. better are the institutions at actually promoting a system that mitigates being a jerk. So if you never have that challenge to really interact and deal with, you might not get the outcomes that we all sort of like as humanists or, or humanitarians from the social order. Um, right? Like you can't plan your way out of a society filled with intolerant people. Um, right. Like and they have to participate and learn. You, you also set me back slightly um, when I sent you an early draft of this and cautioning against uh, just the idea of humanitarianism, which you said is also fraught with danger. And, and I, think, 
I think there's a lot of good research that suggests that the majority of our social problems in today's society, especially the 20th century, are the result of humanitarianism. Um, uh, foreign aid, foreign military interventionism, even slavery uh, had humanitarian origins. Uh, criminal justice rehabilitation programs. I mean, uh, a, part and parcel of the classical liberal worldview uh, is being able to diagnose social problems as the result of failed uh, public planning, um, largely sponsored and, and popularized on humanitarian grounds. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not, maybe, I'm, um, this is not a good word to have chosen, but I actually, I don't, I don't want to just make it about the word. I mean, it's true that your intentions, your your love for humanity, aren't going to get you, you know, uh, where we where we're going. Um, right. And and in many ways, brutalism is constructed as a reaction against humanitarianism. Am I right about that, architecturally and ideologically? Um, I mean, I don't. I, again, I don't know enough about the history of uh, of brutalism as an ideology. But again, my my first impression was that the majority of original modernist and, and even brutalist architects themselves self-identified as humanitarians. Um, that they were socialists. That right. they, they, they were aiming at equality and, 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 and the, the sort of uh, reversal of class privilege and, 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 and those sorts of, uh, uh, of ideals. Well, if you are going to um, come up with a kind of contrast to what you think of as um, you know, something different from ideological brutalism within the libertarian world. What, how would you how would you present it? Well, one of the the ideas I've been toying with, and I'm going to be giving a, a an online webinar with the uh, European Students for Liberty about this topic. Um, but I call it for a new positive liberalism. Um, when you read Bleeding Heart libertarians. They want to argue that the humanitarian intention is what should sort of unify us towards uh, a libertarian identity. And if you read the natural rights book, they tend to say that no, 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 the non-aggression principle and the sort of commitment to, um, to the basic morality positions of, of rights are what should unite libertarians. And I'm not really one for either of those. I'm, I, I'm not much of a, of a normative uh, libertarian at all. I think before we can talk about strategy, we need to get the facts right. I think that the, how you interpret um, the, the wealth and poverty of nations, the history of economic uh, development, um, and if you can recognize the role of freedom uh, in that process, uh, that should be the, the sort of starting point. Um, do we understand the mechanisms of how society operates? Um, once we agree that, okay, these are the facts, things are better today than they were before, and things uh, are, are more capitalistic here and less capitalistic there, and what the causes and consequences of those processes are, right? If you can get the, 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 the sort of sheer physics down, then we can have a conversation about strategy and how to promote social change and those sort of things. And in the current discussions between these sort of feuding normative camps, I don't think there's, there's a lot of consensus on the facts. I think there's a lot of people who are very, very confused about the facts. Deirdre McCloskey's response to, to the Bleeding Hearts was like, you guys don't seem to know very much about history. That's, that's problematic. Um, when, it, when I read uh, the natural rights uh, sort of perspectives, um, they definitely seem guilty of, of brutalism insofar as y they invent systems of, 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 of legal processes that have no place in, in, in any real history. Context. Right. Right. No, no uh, precedent in hum actual human experience. Right. Uh, you know, imagining that you can sort of deduce, you know, the whole of how society ought to operate uh, juridically um, out of, you know, basically what you think should happen. I mean, that's, which is and, a little absurd. 
and Mises has, I mean, some really great points on this in liberalism. He's like, look, you know, liberalism, liberty second, science first. It's like the the class, and and most people, uh, there's a lot of confused terms in our movement today. People juxtapose classical liberalism with libertarianism as though libertarianism is just more radical or uh, more principled than classical liberals, like classical liberals are somehow wishy-washy. But actually, uh, it seems to me that the term libertarianism is far more politically charged, whereas classical liberalism was far more a scientific pro uh, project, a, a research program. Uh, uh, hey, guys, uh, isn't liberty something that matters in the operations of humans and let's understand how it works and what it does? Libertarianism was let's all get together and change the world. Um, and I think that that's the problem. <laughs> that uh, the way the world changes is, is often best when no one's doing the changing. Uh, intentionally. Um, liberalism is an appreciation of, of context or of, of environment more so than it is a, a blueprint or a strategy of, uh, of implementing change. Yeah, that is really interesting. You know, you wonder sometimes when you, when you think about these things, you know, how, how long the word libertarianism is going to survive, actually, because I'm not sure that anybody is entirely happy with it, if you know what I mean. I mean, it's it's sad that in today's political climate, the word liberty is now sort of besmirched. Uh, I, have, I have a lot of students who are really smart, and they love, like, attending IHS and reading all this stuff, and, like, they get spontaneous order, but like push comes to shove, they have no desire to call themselves libertarians. Right. Um, and it, it makes them flinch to show programming that's so like sort of marketed with like liberty, like right on the front. Um, uh, it, it's, it, I mean, it's strange. It, it, it's like the idea that freedom is now like a, a dirty word or something, or uh, um or, or in, inversely, the way in which a lot of a lot of our like brutalist friends uh, react to any conversation surrounding race or gender or class or, or, or those sorts of topics. It, it's a buzzword that just means you're a leftist. And yeah, that's been a little bit frustrating to me, actually. Uh, people are too quick, actually, uh, generally, to uh, dismiss arguments based on si signaling. Rather than actually reading the the, the thing, I mean, I, I've, I've experienced this with a whole range of issues, from intellectual property, which I got in into probably four or five years ago, and discovered you know all kind of new things I didn't know, and more recently with cryptocurrency. You know, uh, th this is a brand new area; it requires actual study. You can't just deduce the whole truth about crypto cryptocurrency based on your existing knowledge if you don't know anything about cryptography, open source networks, and you know that sort of thing. I mean, it requires actual study and actual learning. And th this is, I think, basically what gave rise to my article today was just this urge to kind of look out the window, broaden your mind, understand the, 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 the richness of the tradition of liberty and what it, what it implies. And it's a lot more than just believing that, you know, j you know in the spontaneous, in the immediate... Uh, deductions that occur to us out of natural rights theory that we can know all things. It's just simply not true. I, I think that's right. The The cryptocurrency metaphor reminds me of how I, I, I first conversed with people about Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I mean, this is, relates to your, your conversation about brutalism. Like, if you go out in society at any given point in time, picking up one individual person, they're likely to be a brute. They're likely to be relatively bigoted, they're likely to be relatively ignorant, they're likely to have um, repugnant positions. Um, but in the context of a social order, those opinions are going to be mitigated and, and sort of filtered, and they might be an actual contributor to a broad liberal cosmopolitan social order. Um, th this is like a, a very similar thing with Wikipedia. Any individual entry can be stupid and, and incorrect and 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 factually uh, uh, erroneous, but the 
the process, the the churn, the the incentives are what what has potential in the medium. Right. And and I mean that's that's Hayek in a nutshell. We yep. we look at the wrong variables. You're supposed to look at the knowledge. You're supposed to look at the process. And that's counterintuitive. We like we like physical things. We like static pictures. We like and and can more easily understand simple things relative to complicated ones. Um, and so I I think it's hard for people in the humanitarian camp also to understand that liberalism as an outcome and cosmopolitan tolerance as an outcome doesn't require a conscious humanitarianism and often is the result of engaged forms of brutalism. Yeah. <clears throat> that is so interesting, Daniel. I'm so thrilled that you made this point. I mean, what it implies for us, I mean, your message is that uh, humanitarian um, libertarianism needs to develop a kind of tolerance towards, towards brutalism, in a way, uh, yeah. to understand its, its broader contribution. And brutalism needs to uh, uh, understand the broader implications of uh, liberty for civilization itself. I mean, so both sides can learn from and tolerate each other uh, towards a, a greater, you know, consensus and understanding. Well, beyond the, the the strategic point, I think that there's some good science and 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 empirical research and data that that supports this idea. Um, when you look at the influence of institutional factors like economic freedom and the measured uh, correlates to it in terms of, of social processes. So like what most of the researchers who are working with Economic Freedom Index are, are investigating now are these like social civil liberties issues. Right. How are the conditions of the poorest uh, affected by economic freedom? How are race relations or uh, gendered rights um, respected and promoted in these contexts, you see a very strong cor strong and predictable correlation between economic freedom and better representation for women in political office, better representation for women in corporate executive positions, um, more legislated uh, e equal rights for voting uh, amongst minorities, uh, lower rates of, of expressed racism, like all of these things um, go hand in hand with economic freedom but the empirical case for um, for planned efforts on this front is, is a lot weaker. Um, we we have data that suggests that if you get a group of people together about a cause, they can pass legislation. Um, so if you if you get uh, any particular minority or faction group together, they'll vote into into effect laws that that suit their interests. Well, whether or not those laws actually translate into uh, tangible outcomes for those populations is a totally different question. Um, and there's a lot less evidence for that. So, in, in other words, what I'm saying is that, like, the, the net effect of, like, people believing repugnant things is very negligible. But the net effect of people uh, having a tolerant environment to... Uh, to trade, to communicate, to uh, to travel, to engage with other people, um, is that the modal like repugnant bigot doesn't express that bigotry. Um, it, it's it's remarkable that it doesn't take a thought police. It doesn't take uh, a sort of like shaming campaign to go around and make people better uh, in order for society to get very progressive and, and, and liberal, like, people just end up that way. Um, I mean, like, gender tolerance and, 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 and sexual identity tolerance and all these things, these are generational issues. Like, no one under the age of, like, 40 actively goes around and, and, and says bigoted things and gets away with it on a regular basis without having to, to sort of sacrifice their own identity and reputation. I mean, I couldn't even imagine... Like, like someone should make a TV show or something where like a KKK member moves to Manhattan and sends their kid to public school. Like, like I'll bet the kid will just have to be more liberal um, than than the parents because it's like, mom, dad, I can't get away with saying this like ridiculous stuff that you teach me every day in school because 
well, I'll have no friends, it's not enjoyable, my teacher treats me differently, all of these other things, even if there wasn't, like, an explicit progressive agenda in the school system. I right. just I think it'd be just practically very difficult to accomplish. And all of that shows up in, in the public opinion data, in the, in the sort of generational data about everything from marriage rates to occupational uh, attitudes, etc., yeah, remarkable. I mean, that that is the great liberal insight and the most difficult one to teach and impart. I mean, look at it. We've been trying for hundreds of years, right? I mean, every generation of uh, liberty-minded scholars has, has, has tried to say basically what you've said again and again, and we'll never stop saying it, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, again, I think that the, like, the reason why why I like to participate in the liberty movement, so to speak, isn't for social change as much as it is for um, social science. Uh, finding a community and growing a community of people who are not only interested in studying the implications of liberty, but also deeply committed to that methodolog methodological project. Uh, and I think this is why, like, so many people are attracted to Austrian economics, is it's very self-aware to say, like, not only is this topic important, but so is the way in which we go about investigating it. Um, it, it sort of requires unique consideration compared to other topics that are often studied. And I think, I mean, that's Hayek's view of social change. Hayek's view of social change is not that we just get the ideas out there. Hayek's view of social change is that if you don't have good methodology in the social sciences, then people have no idea how to figure out how to solve social problems. Yeah, and and um, and that change comes about, you know, gradually and spontaneously and in surprising ways, not ever top down, but more organically and integrally to the actual behaviors and actions of individuals in the social order. Yeah, I think that's right. I um, I had a blog post recently on uh, the skeptical libertarian Dan Beer's blog, yeah. um, and it it was basically I was just trying to figure out a way to write an annotated bibliography for public choice. Like, if you're a smart undergrad and thinking about going to grad school, what are the eight books about public choice you should read? Um, and I ended up wanting to to make this quip about, it's called public choice for a reason. It's not government choice. It's public choice. So I, I tend to think, again, this is a problem of like normative libertarians where anything that's voluntary is, is, is morally good and preferable and should be supported on libertarian grounds. And anything that's not voluntary and governmental should be, should be uh, disregarded. I'm more sympathetic to the latter part of that, that analysis, right? That there, there is something inherently problematic about using coercive force in the context of government. But to say that any voluntary association is, is preferred for the cause of liberalism is a bit problematic. Um, getting together a lot of people and sort of like inspiring them to, to coordinate their behaviors in a specific way can have political repercussions uh, that, that grow the state. Um, I, I'm often fond of saying that, like, if everyone woke up tomorrow uh, in America and, like, put on a Ron Paul t-shirt, my guess is that the world would become less free, not more, uh, right? Like, like getting everyone riled up to do anything in, in unison is, is, is a problem of collectivism. Yep. But if everybody woke up tomorrow and had a genuine comprehension of, like, the material content of Man, Economy, and State, or Anarchy, State, and Utopia, or um, even just like an intermediate economics book, um, the world could become more free. Maybe indirect, maybe slow, maybe maybe marginal. Um, but I definitely think that that populist strategies often downplay um, the the unintended consequence part of, of, of their potential. Yeah, it's, it's, it's brilliantly put. Well, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for digging through my article, for providing a special kind of nuance that I think only you can really do. I mean, having been a student of architecture and a 
and a very deep student of, of liberalism and, and anarchist uh, thought. I really appreciate uh, you're having spent time with this piece and, you know, help me with it, uh, providing a good corrective. And I'm going to enjoy the debate going f uh, forward. So I, I very much... Yeah, I've been, I've been following all the all the posts on Facebook. Some some people take it really personally, right? Like, you must be talking about me. Yeah, that's uh, funny. Even it's though you're clear funny. and you say it's archetypal, so... Yeah, no, I mean, don't you think? I mean, it's, it's not... My, the point is not to just single people out, really. And if you feel if you feel under, under attacked, then that's probably probably not the right response. You know, I mean, I yeah. think I think there's elements of humanitarianism and brutalism in, in, in all of us, really. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the goal is to you know provi you know provide some elucidation of these you know, contrasting perspectives and, and 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 see what happens. So, but thank you so much, Dan. And uh, by the way, um, you're going to be running a class on Liberty.me. Um, I hope so. Yeah, within a few weeks, I think. I mean, this universe that I've created, this little world, not I've not created it, but I mean, I'm sort of, I guess, behind it, is so spectacular. I'm, I'm, I'm digging through it right now, and we're, we're like one day away from a closed beta release, and I was just talking to my angel investors this morning just to how horrified I am in retrospect that I ever imagined such thing like this could exist. Uh, and they're like, well, no, uh, don't be, don't be mortified by that, because um, you know every every great entrepreneur invents things that don't exist and that, in retrospect, are insane. And sure. this is an insane project. And but I'm I'm in love with it, and I'm, I feel a sense of guilt about all the work that I put everybody through to create it. On the other hand, you know, I believe very strongly in the possibility of of uh, using these digital spaces as a frontier for the recreation of the social order itself. And this is what, we're taking that first step, you know, towards that. And there's nothing like it uh, anywhere on the World Wide Web. I mean, forget, mm. forget libertarianism, forget ideological stuff. There's nothing like liberty.me anywhere on the web. I mean, that's how extreme and outrageous um, this is going to be. So I'm, I'm very pleased that you're gonna be the f first professor to uh, you know, teach a class within this within this context. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Right now, I'm I'm doing one with uh, the Learn Liberty Academy with with IHS. Yeah, it's going well. Um, there there's a few kinks in the system as as sure. there's inevitably going to be, but um, I I mean, I just wish there were more sort of opportunities and people participating because at this point, I'm I'm learning a lot. Uh, as as the faculty member, I mean, the it's funny because in this context, like Facebook is better than my classroom. Um, kids are sharing their own research that they're doing mean. their own searching for, right. and 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 compared to discussions that take place in my real time, real life classroom. Like this one's better. It's a sorted sample of people who who give a shit and do the reading. It's a it's a it's a venue for recording the like real material um, in in meaningful organization. Um, I mean, I I hope I hope what we're doing right now gets like archived or whatever because I want to use it for my own publication purposes and, right. and sort of research uh, stream. And I I just imagine that your your universe is going to be all the more functional. In well, and, and you know the the goal in creating every single uh, page and space within this little city city is to extract uh, information from people who are using it, right? Mm. It's about just delivering stuff. We're really looking for crowdsourced um, types of knowledge and growth, and you feel that when you're on the site, you have a sense that you matter as a user. You know, on every single page, and that's. Yeah. That's really new. I was realizing that just this morning. I'm saying that because I was toured the site this morning for preparation for this closed beta. Uh, but that's what's totally different about it. And there's no place in which you feel as if you're blocked. Your 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 contribution, your your intellectual contribution, is not wanted. It's always wanted, because I, I genuinely believe this. I don't I don't think that any of us are capable on our own of Imagining all truth into to knowing all truth. That ultimately, 
if we come together as individuals, uh, the result is going to be greater than the sum of its parts. I, mean, I really believe that. That's what intellectual history shows me. It's the history of innovation shows me. And so I, I wanted to create a space in which that was true for, for the liberty-minded uh, community. So, anyway, thank you for being a part of that, and thank you for, uh, for talking to me today. I, I very much appreciate it. And I guess um, the rest of the day is going to be more hysteria and frenzy about this article, <laughs> which I'm looking forward to. Good luck, Jeff. Okay, thank you so much, Daniel. Take care. Bye-bye.